All right, our next speaker is Richard Berry. He is the founder of Free Artos and principal engineer at AWS. Oop, and it looks like we're still getting organized. Okay. Yeah, I need to. Uh, yes, I'm one of the awkward people that wanted to use their own computer. Okay, so uh, I know when I switch to the other screen, I'm going to have to fiddle a bit because it's come up in the wrong mode there. But never mind, so it's been right for using my own computer. So uh, as, as just said, I was the uh, original founder of the Free Autos project. This talk is going to be a lot less academic, shall I say, than, than the previous ones or some of the other talks uh, today and yesterday. I'm going to, uh, first of all, go through a little bit about what Free Autos is, uh, to give people context, especially the people who are from the, the kind of a Linux background. It's not Linux, and I'll just demonstrate that. And then look at the, the steps to go through to actually run Free Autos on a RISC-V core. So first of all, what is Free Autos? Well, basically, boil it down, it is a C library that implements multi-threading. If you come from uh, you know, a, a bare metal programming environment, then you would consider it, or you might call it, a real-time operating system. If you're coming from a more rich environment like Linux or QNX or something like that, then you would probably just call it a scheduler or a kernel. I think it's more than a scheduler because it has inter-task and actually inter-core communication primitives as well. It's been around for uh, it's a, a bit lost in the mists of time, but at least 15 years, probably a little bit more than that. And over the years, uh, you know, the market's changed a lot. It's interesting, actually, that we started off in the early days with very simple cores. Things got more and more and more and more complex up to the ARM VAM, which was a kind of step, step increment in complexity. And um, now with RISC-V, it's uh, a kind of breath of fresh air and how, how simple the architecture is again. Over the years, like I say, the market's changed a lot, and I think part of the success of Free Autos, because it's downloaded about once every three minutes now, which I always find incredible, because I don't know like, who those people are and how many projects there are in the world, but that's independent figures, not ours. But I think one of, our, uh, one of the things we've done is always try to adapt to the changing market. And this is where really risk five at the moment, we, I think we counted six unofficial ports to Free Autos on risk five. So there's obviously demand there and wanting to uh, service what people are one, uh, you know, what the demand is. We created an official port at the moment. It's, a, uh, it's quite basic in that uh, the cores that we uh, targeted originally only had machine mode. and uh, They didn't have the memory protection, but now we're evolving it further. Just, uh, just to really emphasize you know, how different this is to Linux, this is typically how you would use uh, FreeRTOS. So like I say, it's C code, you add it to your application. There's no virtual memory. Uh, a lot of systems will use memory protection, but very often uh, without memory protection even. And the application code can call into the kernel code to, make, you know, to create threads. Those threads can then use the intertask communication primitives. Typically, you would have middleware. The middleware may or may not use free RTOS, and the application code can talk directly to the hardware as well. So it is very simple. Now, free RTOS runs on 8-bit devices, and it runs on 64-bit devices. But the real kind of sweet spot, the growth area, is in 32-bit microcontrollers. So we are talking tens of kilobytes of RAM, and hundreds of kilobytes of flash. And then if you're coming from the Linux world, uh, the obvious question is, well, why would you want multi-threading in that kind of environment? And I think the key is what I've already said. The complexity of the hardware has increased over the years. 
The complexity of the software has increased over the years. One of the great things about having an open source operating system is I have no commercial vested interest in trying to get you to use it. It's just to use the correct tools for the correct job. Now, um, Freosos is used in all industry sectors. I, I would um, challenge anybody to mention an industry sector where, it's, where you won't find Freosos being used. And that means that you know, it's used in simple applications and it's used in uh, really complex applications. To emphasize that at the moment and really um, to, to bring in why uh, cloud companies are interested in small operating systems at the moment, of course, the huge trend now is Internet of Things. If we look at um, this on the screen at the moment is showing services that a cloud company would uh, typically provide. This is actually AWS, but I should emphasize here that although AWS are um, sponsoring a lot of this work, everything is MIT licensed. It's all open source software, so you can use it for anything you like. Uh, it's not tied to AWS in any way. You don't have to be a customer or anything like that. But here you see on the left-hand side, we have the gateway. That's where the, uh, the data is coming in. On the right-hand side, we have where we actually get value from you know, sending that data to the cloud. And this is where if we can collect all our data in one place, then we can reason on it. We can do like machine learning, predictive maintenance, or that kind of thing. But before we can get to that value, there is what we call the undifferentiating functionality. This is the functionality that anybody who's connecting has to have in place before they can actually get to the value. So cloud companies try and help people get to the value as quickly as possible by providing things like, well, the gateway is obvious, you know, the, sec the security, the, you know, the encryption, that kind of thing, the authentication. AWS has mutual authentication, so the device has to authenticate the server, the server has to authenticate the device. And then we've got onboarding, provisioning, uh, you know, management, lifecycle management, over-the-air updates, all this kind of thing. That's all well and good, and hopefully once you've connected, then you can get to the value as quickly as possible. So what about the device that's actually connecting? Then they have all the kind of reciprocal client size of everything that's in the server. And if you, you know, you can imagine you, that you are perhaps a, a genius in motor control, you know, brain the size of a planet, you've got all these you know, PhDs coming out your ears and this kind of thing, and you've written a very, a very tight, uh, very well, you know, um, uh, high fidelity motor control loop. Maybe in this diagram, maybe you are you know, just communicating directly with the hardware because you've used assembly language for optimization. Maybe you're writing it in C. And then you have to cloud connect it um, Okay, so your specialization is motor control, so, and you're a genius, but even so, once you cloud connect it, you can see there's all this non-differentiating infrastructure or functionality that you have to have. You have to decide which protocols you want to use. You have to decide, or have to understand what TLS is. You have to understand how you can uh, securely store keys and certificates and all that kind of thing. MQTT, by the way, is the IP-based protocol often used in IoT applications. So now you can either go away and learn all this stuff yourself, which is going to take a long time and, you, and it's outside your speciality, might not do so well, or you can hire in more people, other specializations. In any case, it's time to market and cost are both going to increase. So first of all, with the kernel, what we can do is say, okay, all these new libraries, they have state, they have to respond to events, they have sequencing, et cetera, et cetera. And historically, we introduce the kernel to there, and your um, what uh, uh, in simpler applications are very sound design techniques uh, for bare metals, you know, without a scheduler of any kind, super loops, state machines, event management, or this kind of thing. Which I'm, I'm not a graphics designer. I always tell people this in these talks. This is what this is supposed to be showing up here, without the multi-threading. And then we can introduce the kernel, and each piece of that functionality can become self-contained. Hopefully much simpler to implement because uh, it has well-defined interfaces. It can be more sequential piece of code. To my mind, the most important thing is how maintainable the code is. You can port this more easily, maintain it a lot more easily. So that's one thing, the kernel. But like I say, um, 
Well, let's just show this first. So what, what we are able to do with the kernel then is say, we'll hide all, all these complex libraries and um, you know, as we look at what people want, we're actually providing these libraries ourselves now. And we'll hide all that in some kind of just blob. You don't really care what's in there. And put very, very simple interfaces. And the kernel enables us to do that. For example, OTA agent. With the OTA agent, rather than having to work it into your application design, you just start it up when the system boots. The agent is like a daemon task, right? It's a thread that runs by itself. It looks for a new download, downloads it in the background, verifies the signature, writes it to Flash, all that kind of thing, and then just tells the application when it's available. The application can then reboot into the new image whenever it wants. So this is uh, what we have been able to do. The, um, the kind of first iteration of this, all the libraries are quite tightly integrated. The next iteration, which you'll find in Git but isn't fully released yet, kind of breaks these things apart as well. So these libraries, like the MQTT, is now agnostic of the transport, so it'll run over MQT, uh, sorry, it'll run over BLE or Wi-Fi or whatever, but it's also um, uh, being tested on Linux, so it'll run on Linux and it'll run on FreeRTOS as well. This is just to show that um, there's nothing unusual in Amazon investing in open source software, and I do uh, like to emphasize again that there is not a tie into Amazon, it's MIT licensed. It's there for, for the goodness of the community. This little graphic, which I have to say is out of date, it takes a long time to create, the, and uh, hence I haven't updated it, just shows all the projects over the years that Amazon have um, contributed to, all the open source projects. This is time uh, uh, color coded from 2016 up to about halfway through 2018. And you can see hidden in there somewhere is FreeRTOS. Okay, so now um, that's the kind of background on what it is, and the main point on that is just to emphasize it's not Linux. It's very, very different to Linux. Now what I want to do is uh, show you how to get FreeRTOS running on a RISC-V core. The first, thing to, to, uh, the first thing you have to do, of course, is understand which source files you need. Now, with the FreeRTOS kernel, most of the source files are common to all architectures. It's ported to about 40-odd different architectures. It's actually quite hard to count, but there's a lot of them. Most of those source files are common, like I say. Then you have to have a certain um, small piece of code, which is typically written in assembly, which is specific to the architecture. This diagram, again, if, apologies for my uh, lack of diagramming abilities, just shows why. So the, the thread that is running I'm using the terms thread and task interchangeably, by, interchangeably, by the way. Sorry to confuse you by that. Uh, all the context is in the processor. When the task is not running, the context is stored on the task stack. So when it starts running again, you know, they're popped off and the task doesn't know anything happened. And that's obviously because you're accessing the registers, you have to do that in assembly, and it's different for every architecture. This diagram then shows the source files for the, uh, actually, ARM. Like I say, there are 40-odd different ports. These are the files which are common to every architecture. You don't actually need all of them. Uh, it depends on what, what functionality you want. Then there's a little hierarchy, so it says GCC for the compiler. And there are lots of different compilers. Then you choose your architecture. This port.c file in this case, contains C code and assembly code. Other ports have the assembly code file split out. Um, now, that's nice and simple because all those architectures are exactly the same. RISC-V poses some challenges, as, a, as do other uh, customizable cores. So how do we manage the fact that uh, different implementations have got different registers? That's shown on here. So this is... Uh, the same to this point that we have the common source files. There's GCC, RISC-V. We've, we've just introduced an IAR port, by the way, as well. Uh, here is the, the source file which manages, actually the, the assembly file is split out separately in here. That manages all the registers that are on every uh, implementation of the RISC-V core. And then we've got this uh, chip-specific extensions. You can see that I, like, I really like verbose names for these things. Um, and that is the part which extends the base port 
to a particular architecture. This is the bit that's going to go slightly wrong very briefly. If we look, let me just do this. Good, good. So here we have the uh, pulp port. Now, see, see here we have the, uh, the header file up here, chip spe specific extensions. This is the RISCI core, as we heard uh, multiple times yesterday. It's got six additional registers. So what we have to do is say, OK, there's six additional registers. Actually, let's show this bit first. Here is the code which is performing the context switch or saving the saving the uh, registers which are available on every core. After that, we call this save additional registers. And that is going to say, OK, there's six additional registers. And um, this is, so I decrement the stack pointer. This is just copying the registers into core local registers and pushing them on the stack. Likewise, it does the same for popping. Now, if we look at the sci 5 core, which I've just um, opened in IAR just because this is new. Here, there's no, no additional registers and the macros are empty. So if you were developing your own core and you've put some kind of extensions in there, then to get the kernel running on there, uh, you, just have to <laughs> just, you just have to provide this little, uh, these couple of macros and uh, you should be good. Oops. And back to here. The next thing is the interrupt stack. Now, in this, um, what we've done is, uh, is a common technique is to say that we will swap interrupt stacks. The reason I'm saying this is because I want to show you how to configure it. Now, why, why do we do that? Well, every thread, again, this is, this is supposed to show a thread here, OK? And the green is the, green is the stack space. You have to dimension the stack. If you don't swap interrupt stacks, then that has to be the maximum call depth or stack usage for the thread and the maximum stack usage for the task because an interrupt can come when any task is running. And that means that you're duplicating, ignore the right-hand side for a minute, you're duplicating that IRQ th uh, thread, uh, stack. Sorry. Now, uh, RAM is our most precious resource, so we don't want to do that. So what we do is switch to a separate IRQ stack. And there are two ways of doing that. If, if we look in the, um, again, come to the IAR. This is running on a RISC-V core, a small RISC-V core. You can define this uh, definition here. This is in the FreeOTUS configuration file. If you do that, then the kernel will allocate a, statically, a, a static array for you itself within the kernel, and it will just switch. Uh, to that for you. Now, if you don't define that, the preferable thing to do is if we look in, oh, excuse me, if we come back to here. Now, when we are, when we call main, main is allocated a stack. As we've just seen, when the scheduler has started, the threads have their own stack, and uh, the stack which is allocated to main is no longer used. Now, as I said, RAM is always our most precious resource. And we want to be able to recover the RAM that was used and is no longer used by main. So to do that, what we can do is just define this uh, linker variable. If you do not have the uh, hash define or pound define, depending on which, uh, which continent you're from, then you must define this linker variable. And what this has done is this, this section here, dot stack section, uh, is the stack which is used by main. And I've just put that link variable to be set to the top address of that. Every time uh, an interrupt occurs, then it will uh, use that address as the stack address, and we've saved all that RAM. OK, so there, they were the only complex bits. The other bits are uh, very simple. Setting the, uh, the, oops, I've gone too far. Setting the Clint base address, you can see why I wanted to use my own computer now. Then, um, if there's no, this is the pulp core. If there's uh, no address, then you can just set that to zero. I'm not, the IR one uh, actually sets it to a real value, but there's no point showing you that. You get the idea. 
Uh, if you set that to zero, then all interrupts are um, handled outside of the kernel. Installing the FreeRTOS trap handler. Now, again, how you do that, if there's a clint, by the way, you don't have to do it. It'll do it automatically. If there's not a clint, then the way it's done is really dependent on the drivers that come with your chip. In this case, there's a statically allocated uh, or compile time allocated vector table. So this FreeRTOS RISC-V trap handler has to be installed in there. Like I say, if there is a clint, you don't have to bother doing anything. Calling external interrupts, again, this is something which is um, uh, kind of chip specific. And here, oh, actually, I think I've got screenshots of that. Yeah. So there's this, there's this macro here. So calling the external interrupt handler is something that happens from the assembly code. So this is a macro that has to be passed to the assembler. And it just uh, defines the, the C function, which is handling, or well, I mean, it could be an assembly function, which is handling the interrupts. Again, this is exactly the same, the IAR project. You can see that the handler name is different, but the macro is the same. It's kind of gone off the screen there, but believe me, it's the same. And that was it. I was going to give you a little demo. If there are, if there are no questions, I can give a little demo. Hello. Uh, it made a big impression on me the fact that you emphasized that everyone from the cloud industry is trying to help the customer to get, to get quickly to the value. And today we saw how you're giving actually help to integrators, to engineers, how they can make their RISC-V core have FreeRTOS working out of the box so the customers could adapt it. But at the same time, your competitor, Microsoft, um, with Azure Sphere, actually they paid MediaTek to create uh, SOC for them. So the customer gets the SOC, it's already integrated with the cloud. It mm -hmm. has the security, everything's there. They just say, put your application there. You don't have to do anything. Just say which interface you want to get the data from and say how you want to send it on Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. Is Amazon planning to have their own SOC, maybe based on RISC-V, to help their customers get quickly to the value? Because you see the Microsoft approach, it's highly integrated. They have their own SOC. Today, just, that's, that's, sorry. That's always the first question I get asked, <laughs> which is why I'm smiling. If you, if you get the same question over and over, probably there's a demand for it. Well, I would say, our, our, if, you, if you look historically at um, the FreeRTOS kernel, uh, we, we've always been agnostic of compilers. We've always been agnostic of uh, the, the chip architectures. So our, our approach is to be as, as flexible as possible and um, to, to provide software which runs on whichever chips people happen to be, to be using at the time. Does that answer your question? <laughs>